Um, I think that would be a nice uh, follow-up to this presentation, because I'm also going to talk about uh, DeFi, centralized exchanges, and how does that compare to centralized exchanges. Um, so I'm Alex, I'm from London, so our company is based, and uh, we, a lot of our work is about, actually can I have a pleasure? Um, okay, so a lot about what we do is understanding how changes work and how um, decentralized exchanges compare to decentralized exchanges. Because really what this is all about is, is there's lost trust in centralized parties, there's lost trust in the banks, there's lost trust in data companies, Google, Facebook, etc. They do whatever they want with their data and we're on to this new you know, uh, revolution in financial services. Um, but one core thing to understand is how we can make it work. And I think liquidity is a big part of that. Uh, but before I get into it, let me tell you a tiny bit about myself. Uh, because every time I go to these conferences and I listen to someone, I think, you know, who is this guy? Why does he know what he knows? Kind of like, what's his path? So I'll give you a very quick um, kind of like overview. So I'm originally from Greece, it's a flag. I uh, moved to London many, many years ago. Uh, Despite that, I College London, then I decided uh, banking is a career to take. Um, no anymore, obviously. Uh, so I worked there for a bit, but in Swiss, uh, I dealt with algorithmic trading and building um, uh, low latency systems. It was always interesting, but then I thought I actually don't know anything about the world, so I went to study, get another degree uh, at Imperial, and then decided I want to go back to banking. So I went to another bank. Uh, soon enough, I realized that even though it's, it's nice to be part of a huge company, I wanted to do something different and do something that will actually impact the world. So I started a company in London, um, current term, got backed by a tier one VC firm. Um, and then briefly after, I go find crypto, which is where we are now. And interestingly, at the same time, I've been following crypto. I've been mining it since I was in college. I've been trading it um, and kind of getting introduced to high frequency trading. I decided it's a really good opportunity to trade it fast. Because if you're not fast enough, um, and if you're not smart about it, you're gonna lose your money in the price risk or in fees. So that's kind of like how, what brings us today. Um, so anybody know what this is? It's the price of Bitcoin and it's relevant uh, volatility. So look at the black line for a sec. That is massive, right? That's 120% at its peak. If, um, if you're a family office, if you're a high worth individual, or if you're anyone pretty much, you don't, wanna, you don't want your portfolio to fluctuate 80%. Right? That's insane, it's crazy. Um, and so that's, that's one of our problems, right? Extreme, extreme volatility. The other one is unreliable data. Most of the exchanges, and I don't mean to put any, any of the exchanges down, uh, they don't have reliable data. And that's bad for any financial service provider. And the last one is time kind of risk. You all know this. Uh, so there's one solution to that. Simple? Well, not so much, but uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details of how this works. It is Saturday evening, after all. I'm sure it's the last thing you want to hear right now. But let's get to the point, right? Uh, does it work? Yes. Uh, so this is what we do. We do two products. Uh, one is an alpha product, the other one is a longer term product. And we help investors, funds, um, stakers actually make money on their Bitcoin. Uh, and the one interesting thing I think I want to focus your attention is, if you look on the right, uh, the Barclay Hedge Crypto Index, which is an index of most of the fund managers, actually tracks Bitcoin, less fees. So what they do is they take your money and they say, I'm going to invest in the crypto market in a smart way, and they just buy Bitcoin. I can do that myself, right? Uh, so we're not, we don't do that. Um, but I'm not trying to shell out product here. I'm trying to do something else. Uh, I'm trying to illustrate the point, which is, uh, if you notice, we're actually making most of our gains from Bitcoin, and that's because of the liquidity. Why that matters is for institutional and retail adoption, what you really need is stability, fees, and regulations, right? Um, for an institution to adopt it, you need these two things, and then they create retail products like ETFs, etc. that obviously retail uh, get into it. I don't think we are considered retail, right? Because we are quite sophisticated in terms of understanding how to go on our Quobi wallet, how to go on our Binance wallet, how to transact on, on the blockchain. Not, I think that's less than 1% of, of, of people globally. Uh, my 
grandma wouldn't know how to do that, right? So my, my, my grandma is an example I take um, of what retail needs, of uh, investing their funds through a mutual uh, product or like an ETF product. So that's where we need to get if we want uh, any of this to work. And the bottleneck, obviously, is poor liquidity. Uh, so let's look at uh, the state of exchange right now, decentralized versus centralized. Um, and I don't need to pick on anyone here, right? I just try to illustrate the point that decentralized exchanges uh, have an unlimited number of pairs. You can exchange anything with anything, right? Low volume, high slippage, or high cost of, of, of buying stuff. Uh, non regulated, because they don't need to yet. Uh, and anonymous. Um, and that the combination of these lead them to poor liquidity. Um, and right now, that's the reason why 1% of volume is on central exchanges versus 99% on centralized. Um, but I'm not a fan of central exchanges, not really. I mean, that's not why I'm here. Um, but why is DeFi liquidity so problematic? Why is it that it's so poor? Um, and I think it's one of four reasons, right? Or maybe a combination of, of these. Um, number one, market makers are not willing to adapt to VEX standards. Maybe it's because it's too small, maybe it's because the systems are too complicated already. I mean, most of them work in equity or FX or other cl asset classes, and it's really hard to adapt to the concept of gas, the concept of on-trade transactions. Uh, and if the pie is small, why would they do that, right? Uh, number two, users need to adapt to the DEX concept. It's quite complicated. Um, and if you look at the UI UX, it's terrible. I mean, you don't even understand how it works. It's terrible. Uh, number three, dilution among trillion pairs, if you have a million pairs, obviously the liquidity per pair is quite small. So that could be a potential problem. And the last one is custody of funds. So if you're a fund in the US, you're not mandated to put your funds in a smart contract, which is audited by some party you don't know about. So it's really hard for funds to actually use smart contracts. Um, so two, three, and four, I'm going to let um, the experts talk about it. Companies like the Planet Core, Hobby, etc. I'm going to talk about number one because that's what we know. Um, so, why is it so difficult for professional liquidity providers to really get in this market and, and, and help out? Well, one reason is on chain latency, right? If you're a market maker, you have a two way price, 49, 51, uh, the market moves to 50, 52. Um, an evil arbitrage guy can go and buy, uh, buy from you at 49, so that 50. One dollar profit off you, right? uh, but the point is you, you can update the price. But by the time you put an update in, the, the arbitrage guy will basically put an other order with more gas, so you know, able to front run you. And so what you're going to do next is put more gas yourself. That creates like a vicious cycle of paying more and more and more, and you can end up paying up that one dollar difference in gas. So if you're a market maker and you want to update the price constantly, you're going to end up paying up a lot of money to fight all these guys and trying to rip you off. And you end up not making any money. So you don't want to do that. Uh, and sufficient volume, the volume is quite low. So you don't really want to put a lot of effort into a very small pie, once again. Um, the last one is volatility, right? Uh, you, can, you can't make money on a sideways market that doesn't move a lot. Because, well, sorry, you can only make mar uh, money on a sideways market. You can't make money on a market that moves in a crazy way uh, because your inventory is actually under risk when the market moves. Um, what can we do about it? Right? That's all great, but uh, this is the problem. What can we do about it? What's, what's the solution? And I think there are three, I mean, th these are three things that we can do I think are important. Uh, one is to work closely with equity providers. So companies, uh, the likes of Zerox, Anchor, JNB, et cetera, need to work with the market makers closely to understand what their needs are. And they do, they've, they've come up with some products, but I think we're still, we're still long to go. Um, and understand how we can incentivize them to work together. Uh, second is support aggregators. So aggregators are companies that provide UI and uh, connect to the back end to provide retail users a product that they can use. So for example, you might have heard of Argent. Um, there was a presentation, there was a panel earlier um, from uh, Mikey which is another aggregator. So these companies are really important because they provide a nice content to you guys to use and buy, you know, whatever, buy Ether, Bitcoin, EOS, I don't care, and then change it to something else in a nice and comfortable way. So 
Um, we need these guys to spread the word, provide a nice product that people can use, provide mention adoption, and have DEXs as the back end of that. And the last one is trustworthy stablecoins, right? I don't want to hold my coins and my, my wealth in uh, a really small Dogecoin. I want to hold my wealth probably in a trustworthy stablecoin, like USDT, whatever else, um, that can be used as an intermediary while I move from one to the other. Um, so th these are three things that we can do. It's not, there's not one that will um, uh, by its own solve all the problems. I think it needs to be a coordinated effort. And ultimately I think um, coordinated efforts, building a community and understanding the details of, of what is actually happening is important uh, for this to actually work out for um, crypto to become more and more adopted by the mainstream, and uh, for that to become, I think it's going to be an extension of the financial markets. I don't think crypto by itself is going to be a new thing. It's not a new thing, but uh, per se, it's an extension of how the markets work, and I think the markets, as they are now, are going to go closer to how crypto works, and crypto is going to go closer to how markets work. So markets will become more digitalized, they'll become more, they'll become faster and more efficient. I think crypto, I see crypto as an extension to um, so that's, uh, I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much, everyone. I do have one more slide with some cool stuff, if we have a few minutes. Yes, Otherwise, if you guys have questions, I'm happy to take them. Chris, uh, how do you find synthetics? Um, do you know synthetics uh, in, in terms of liquidity and providing uh, all the things that you need for, for crypto? Uh, yes, it's previously called Heaven. Uh, Heaven, right? Yeah, I, I did. Uh, I know the project. I was actually one of the early um, syndicates into the project. Um, I think. Uh, I think in terms of stablecoin, it hasn't really been that stable uh, its value. So it's, it's fluctuated quite a lot, uh, which is not ideal. And I noticed that they have an exchange, the Norse exchange recently, uh, which I think is great, I like that. Uh, but still, liquidity proves to be an issue. And I think uh, one, of, one of the ways it could, uh, it could boost its liquidity is work with liquidity providers to bring more stuff in there and make it bigger and cheaper and more efficient. Does that answer your question or no? Yeah, uh, just a, a follow up because what they're doing is right now is uh, kind of a lot of synths in terms of synthetic assets and uh, derivatives on crypto. How do you find the space? Um, I think it's it's great to create synthetics uh, for different trading pairs. I think it provides the ability for you to take a bond on anything, anything you want, any pair versus any pair. Um, but I think the more pairs you have, the less volume you have on. on on the average pair, so that creates you know, like a, a dilution effect. But conceptually, that the concept of synthetic I think is great. Uh, I think it's cheap as well. So you have like a token for everything. Just create a synthetic exposure. Yes, that's cool. Here's three cool things that we look at. On the left is basically a bunch of crypto assets that we, we have a machine learning approach that we cluster them dynamically. So at each unit, at each, at each time, it creates three different ex extinct groups of uh, assets that one is invested. In the middle, you have a PCA approach, which is clustering uh, wallets from each other. So you can see, for example, in yellow, that's a cluster of uh, bots, which are trading reactively. Uh, and then on the top right, you see some whales. And then finally, this is one of the things that we look at by a provider that we have, which is basically visualizing mempool data. So mempool is, the memory pool is the transaction of the blockchain that haven't been confirmed yet, but they're in the post of getting confirmed. Um, and that shows you kind of like the momentum um, on, the, on, on the blockchain. Uh, that's pretty much it. Thanks a lot, man.